So what's going on here? If they didn't land Apollo 11 on the moon, did they land 12 or 14 or 15? Because there are six missions that NASA claim landed on the moon. Did any of them go? Were they getting a bit nearer each time? Well, let's present some evidence from Apollo 17, the last mission which supposedly landed on the lunar surface. Um, here are two photographs from that mission. If we look at the top one, um, we've, we've featured this on Rich Planet before, but I think it's important to go through it again. So what we're led to believe here, if you just look at the top image, is that the lunar land has come down, it's landed on the lunar surface, the astronauts have got out, climbed down this ladder, and they've walked towards the camera. One of them's turned around and taken a snapshot of the lunar lander with some hills in the background. They've then continued walking in the same direction, 150 meters. One of them's then started doing a little experiment. The other one turns around and takes a photograph of him with the background. So you can see the lunar lander here in the two shots. Now just look at the backdrops. Look how similar they are. Look at Hill B here with a shading on it. What are the chances on Earth if me and you get out of a car and I take a photograph of the car and then we walk 150 meters down the road and I take a photograph of you with a car in the background, what are the chances of getting an almost identical backdrop, right? Now a skeptic contacted me and said, no, no, the backdrops aren't identical if you look very closely. There's slight differences in shadows and things here. Well, if what they tell us is true, that, the, that there was front screen projection system that was used, i.e. thousands of tiny beads uh, reflecting an image, perhaps these uh, images were also taken on, the, on a different day, you are going to get di uh, differences. They're not going to be identical. It would, it's not like compositing a green screen image where the images would be identical. So you would expect slight differences in shadow and that kind of thing, which is exactly what we see. So this is, this is very strong evidence, in my opinion, that those, these photographs are taken in a studio. People have even worked out the size of this studio. You're talking a huge studio, probably in a hangar, uh, of the order of 300 meters uh, to the actual backdrop. Uh, so um, it doesn't look good for NASA. And this doesn't prove that Apollo 17 didn't land. It just proves that they've faked some photographs uh, in a studio, or it's strong evidence that they've faked some photographs in a studio. So. I think they're very, very worried about this evidence. The evidence of Apollo 11, and the new evidence that I've just showed you, because um, it doesn't look good for NASA. And that's why we get articles like this one. This appeared in the Metro newspaper last year, titled, Here's Why the Moon Landings Weren't Faked. New Conspiracy Study Proves It. So they feel the need to deny moon conspiracy theories. So it says, in the wilder reaches of the internet, lots of people still believe that NASA faked the moon landings and possibly even its entire space program. But it's absolute balls, a new study has shown. It would have simply uh, been impossible to keep it a secret, according to Oxford scientists, if the moon landings had been a hoax involving an estimated 411,000 people, it would have been found out in three years and eight months. <laughs> British physicist Dr. David Grimes worked out a mathematical way to calculate the chances of a plot being deliberately leaked by a whistleblower or accidentally uncovered. Now then, what this shows is that Dr. David Grimes has done no research into what moon ho uh, hoax researchers claim, right? So if you read one of the earliest books by Bill Casing written in the 1970s called We Never Went to the Moon, he explains that the whole thing was done without informing all of NASA. In fact, only informing a tiny handful of people. It's all in his book. So why hasn't David, uh, Dr. Grimes looked at this book? So in Bill Casing's book, uh, Bill Casing was a technologist. He worked on some of the Apollo technology. Um, he explains, yes, there was a visible NASA Apollo program, um, but there was also another secret project called the ASP, the Apollo Simulation Project. This is all in Bill Casey's book. And he claims that they had a secret base in Nevada, so a considerable sum of money spent on this group that was used to hoax the mission, between um, four and seven billion dollars. But even that group, even the secret group that was hoaxing the mission, was being run to Manhattan Project style rules. So only a few people underneath actually knew what was going on. So the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, only six people knew what they were doing. And Bill Casing claims that with the, with the hoax moon landings, uh, it was the same. So let me give you a little example. In my career as an engineer, the company I worked for used to build these things. This is a, a generator 
in a power station, produces the electricity that comes in your home. So I worked for a company called NEI that used to build these. And I worked in the control systems department. So when you have a huge generator like, like this, you have a rack of electronics called an AVR, Automatic Voltage Regulator, which would look something like that. And it's controlling all aspects of that generator, the voltage and the frequencies and that kind of thing. Now, what you, will, what you do not do is build your control system and just plug it in and expect it to work, because these cost millions of pounds to build. So what you do is you build a, you build a simulator. So you, it's a box of electronics which will emulate in every respect that piece of hardware, that 500 megawatt generator. And in my time at NAI, this is one of the projects that I was involved with. There's the specifications, Richard. There's an electronics lab. Go ahead and build the generator simulator. So once that's built, the AVR, the control system, is then plugged into it, and then is used. So the simulator is used to test and debug the control system. So you know that it's all working correctly because you've you've proved it with a simulator. And only then do you take it to your power station, and then you know it's going to work. So the point I'm making is that simulators are a very important part in engineering. They're used all over the place. I've worked on two or three different simulator projects in my time as an engineer. Now, if you consider the control desks at NASA for these various Apollo missions, um, some of these desks might be just monitoring things on the mission. Others might be actually sending data to the mission and controlling things. So if all this technology would need to be tested. You wouldn't just build these desks and then use it live on a mission. You would build a simulator. So that simulator would simulate everything in the Apollo uh, rocket, and it would simulate all of the communication data. Now that simulator might be in the same room. It could be in a different. Uh, it could be in a different city because it's a comms simulator. But the point is, engineers would be tasked to build a simulator to test the control room. <clears throat> now those guys would not be told, "Hey, we're going to use this to fake the mission." But that technology that they built could well be. <clears throat> so the same applies to the sets. They wouldn't, if they're building these 300 meter sets with their front screen projection systems, right? They're not going to tell all the guys building them what they're being, what they're for. Well, the hooks and the mission lads, come on, we put the front screen projection up. They don't. That's not how they work. They're told, well, this is for publicity. Okay. So that's how it works, and it's all explained in Bill Casing's 1970s book, We Never Went to the Moon. So as I say, Dr. David Grimes has done no work, no research. So I wrote to Dr. David Grimes to tell him this, and um, I didn't get a reply. So I, I explained to him what I've just explained to you, and I sent him a link to this book, little booklet that I've written all about Mars. Um, because as you may know, you may have seen some of the programs on Rich Planet. I've been working on this for a number of years now, and I'm fairly convinced now. It is a hypothesis, so I wouldn't stake my life on it, right? But I'm fairly convinced that none of the um, rovers and landers that they say they've sent to Mars landed on the, on the Martian surface. I've challenged anyone to read this book, and then um, after it, think that they're on Mars. And in my opinion, it's been done in, this, in a very similar fashion to how they did it with Apollo, where, they, where all these guys here who really did build a rover, and it really did send it to the rocket, etc., but it never went to Mars. But all these guys believe it is on Mars. That's, that's how the conspiracies are run, in my opinion. And I communicated with this guy, Robert Manning, senior engineer on the Curiosity Project, and he agreed to answer any technical question that I put to him. So Andrew Johnson and myself, we drafted up 26 questions, and he answered one question and ran away from the rest. So if you want to read all of those questions and the emails that I've shared with uh, Robert Manning, it's all in that book. You can decide for yourself whether you think they're lying or not. Okay, and just um, this Sunday, just gone, I noticed I was filling my van up with petrol on the way here, and uh, this is the front page of the Sunday Times after I've just presented this new Peter Hyatt research, yeah? Front page of the Times, the last men on the moon win two tickets to see the astronauts. Is that a coincidence? I'm going to read some comments now from Wikipedia about NASA. Just to point out, I don't read from Wikipedia because it represents truth. I read from Wikipedia because it represents the official narrative. It, it, it represents what NASA has told the public. So this is the first comment I want to draw people's attention to. 
Apollo set major milestones in human spaceflight. It stands alone in sending manned missions beyond low Earth orbit and landing humans on another celestial body. So just consider that. Nobody else, no country, no organization other than the Apollo moon missions have sent anyone beyond low Earth orbit. Now if you consider the evidence that I've just presented, it's quite possible that those Apollo moon missions did not go beyond low Earth orbit. So what this is telling me, at least in the white world, the acknowledged space projects, possibly none of them have gone beyond low Earth orbit. Here's another quote from Wikipedia. The first manned flight of Orion, that's the new rocket that they're developing, and SLA, Exploration Mission 2, EM2, is to launch between 2019 and 2021. It is a 10 to 14 day mission planned to place a crew of four into lunar orbit. So it's going to take them till 2020 just to get a man to orbit the moon. Now according to NASA, there were eight missions in the 1960s which orbited the moon with men in the spacecraft. That was 50 years ago. So why is it taking them up until 2020 to do the same? In my opinion, this is more evidence that those 1960s missions probably did not go anywhere near the moon. Here's another quote. On December the 4th, 2006, NASA announced it was planning a permanent moon base. The goal was to start building the moon base by 2020, and by 2024, have a fully functional base. In 2010, President Barack Obama halted existing plans, including the moon base, and directed focus on manned missions to asteroids and Mars, as well as extending support for the International Space Station. So that's very, very unusual. What he's done is cancelled this moon project and replaced it with much more far-fetched or much more difficult projects, landing someone on an asteroid or on Mars. So again, I think this is, could be evidence that we haven't been, at least in the white world, we haven't been beyond low Earth orbit. And that brings about the question, is there some sort of constraint? Now, I've spoken about NASA, and I would suggest that NASA's projects, some of them are fraudulent, not all of them. I think some of the unmanned projects have been real. I think the space shuttle was real. I think the International Space Station is real. But I'm very doubtful about whether Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and I'm very doubtful about whether any of the Mars rover missions are real. So NASA's running frauds, in my opinion. So it's possible then that white, at least white world projects have never left low Earth orbit, as I've suggested there. And we're going to look at some more evidence from Apollo missions now, Andrew. And yes, so we wanted to talk about the rocks first. Is that right? We're going to yes. I mean, I'll just mention, following on from the Bill Cating thing, just a couple of other things. You could probably get hold of Bill Cating's book. We never went to them fairly easily, uh, and there were, I think there are various downloads of it available as well as obviously paper copies. Same thing with Ralph Renee's book, which I recommend for people, um, which is uh, NASA Moon America. I had a couple of people writing to me about, for example, problems that would appear in the Apollo films with pressurization of the spacesuits uh, that they would, you know, they would inflate like a Michelin Man type of thing. And a lot of that is covered in Ralph Renee's book, and this chap that wrote to me hadn't, hadn't realized that. So, again, people that are thinking of those things now and thinking, hang on, what about this, what about that? I suggest that they read Ralph Renee's book and watch as many of the videos that are available, such as the one on David Percy's website, allis.com, because you may find that a lot of that stuff is already covered in there. It's just that you know you were not yet aware of it. Right. Now, uh, one website that I would recommend is um, Jarrah White's website. Just tell us about him, Andrew. Yes, and that view, that was sort of logic that follows on, that Jarrah White is uh, well, he's younger than us. I'm not quite sure how old he is. He, he describes himself as the, the grandson of the moon hoax or something. Uh, and he did get to know Ralph Rene before he died, and I think uh, Ger Gerard White is now, um, you know, he's selling copies of uh, Ralph Rene's book. And Gerard White has done many videos on the Apollo hoax, many different aspects. Um, I did a broadcast with him um, three or four years ago um, with Morgan Reynolds, Dr. Morgan Reynolds, who also, you know, doesn't, uh, he's, he's sure like we are that they didn't go to the moon with the Apollo craft. 
And Gerard White has done many uh, useful videos, one of which we're going to discuss today, where he goes through a lot of the scientific data for various aspects of the missions. And one particular one that just come to my mind is about this account of the um, Russian Mir space station, where they put a Russian flag you know, outside the space station um, on one of the spacewalks that they did. And then uh, there was another comment made in, on a later mission where they said, well, we need to go and retrieve the flag because it's going to get in the way of this new equipment or something. And then the other cosmonaut says, no, don't bother. There's nothing left of it. It's all been you know, dissolved away by micrometeoroids and stuff. And Gerard White made a point of discussing this because NASA had claimed that they could still see evidence of the uh, flag on the moon that the you know, Apollo crew had left there after 40 years. But this other flag on the Mir space station, I think, had only been in space for about 18 months before there was just basically nothing left right. of it. And so he was making this comparison. You can watch, watch yeah. the video about that. His channel is called Moon Faker. Right. As you say, he's made hours and hours and hours of videos. And he's had ch many... Challenging the moon missions. Yeah. And he, people who were connected to NASA have, have tried to challenge him, haven't they? Or they've Correct. tried to discredit him in different ways. Yes, and he's had many sort of DMCA, DMCA attacks on his channel, people filing spurious copyright claims, and all the you know, Apollo films are in the public domain anyway, you know, and that sort of thing. Right, so let's just touch on one of the things that he's covered, which is the, uh, well, it's the Chinese mission. So in 2013, China sent a rover to, to the moon, which was unmanned, and it, it, was, it had hardware on it which could um, collect samples of the soil and then analyze those samples using a, an X-ray spectrometer. And it then sent the data back through a, through a radio comms link yes. and produced a graph which has been published by the Chinese. It's, it's, um, I'll just put the graph up on the screen. It's probably not going to mean a lot to most viewers, but this is... Um, an X-ray spectroscopy graph, and what it, what you can derive from that, is the percentage composition for all of the different chemical elements, so such as um, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, potassium, calcium, titanium, chromium, etc., etc. So, you you really would need to watch the video to work out how Jarrow White has. Because uh, he has a scientific background in geology, doesn't he? I think something like that, yes, um, yes, and, yes. And how he's, how he's from this um, spectroscopy graph, he's worked out the percentages of the various different uh, elements. elements. Yes, and this video is called a Chinese road trip, I'm sure. You're Chinese probably... road trip, so it's moon faker, Chinese road trip. So you'd need to watch that to get the full details. And you probably need to watch it twice as well, because it's very, very dense with details. Right. Now, the rocks that... Um, the Apollo missions allegedly brought back. I can put this graphic up from Jarrow White's video. This shows a picture of the moon, and the numbers there, 12, 14, 16, denote the various Apollo missions. So we've got Apollo 12 there, Apollo 14, 16, 11, 17. So this is where um, Apollo allegedly landed on the moon, the various sites. And the white arrow there, we can see this is where the Chinese uh, rover landed and took samples in that area. Now. The rocks that supposedly came back from the moon, um, you can get scientific data which has all been published on the chemical composition of those rocks. And the, the makeup of those rocks is very similar from the six Apollo sites, as he describes in the film. Right? But what Jarrow White has then done is compared the Chinese results with the published results that NASA have put out on the rocks. And what he, what he finds is that that someone's lying. Yeah. Someone's yeah. lying. Yeah. Um, so let's just look at magnesium. Like I say, in order to get the full reference and, and the reasoning or how these graphs have been derived, you need to watch the video. Uh, but we've got magnesium here. We see uh, on the right hand side there, that's the Chang E3, the Chinese mission, 0.2% uh, percent for magnesium. And we've got um, all of the Apollo missions, Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, much, much higher. And we can just zip through the various different elements. Aluminium, again, Chang'e 3, much, much lower in aluminium. Silicon. Potassium, no anomaly there. So Apollo 14, the rocks there had a slightly higher potassium content than the mm. rest of the Apollo missions. Mm. So there's no real anomaly there with potassium. Calcium, titanium, chromium, 
iron again, no anomaly with iron, strontium, yttrium, and zir zirconium. So the rocks that, that, that China have analyzed are totally different, totally yes. different in, in, in almost every way to what NASA have allegedly brought back from them. And I think Gerald White suggests that the ones that, that, that Apollo claim to be from the moon, they're just from some remote part of the Earth, probably. That's, that's what he suggests. Yeah, I think he makes some comparisons to certain uh, Earth geology to draw that conclusion. It is a very detailed video and very, very well done. Uh, I'm not sure it's something I'd be capable of making, but uh, I recommend people watch it and uh, you know, decide uh, what they think is uh, going on. Right, right. And just an, as an aside, with regards to Buzz Aldrin, Andrew sent me a video of um, Donald Trump doing some sort of presentation because allegedly Trump is relaunching some of the, some certain space missions mm. and they had this gathering at the White House or wherever it was. Mm. And, and Buzz Aldrin was there. Just just tell us about that. Yeah, so it, it, uh, it, yeah. It, I think they, somebody's taken a portion of this video and then just zoomed in on Buzz Aldrin's face and the, the, the camera is fixed on Aldrin's face whilst Trump is speaking so you can hear Trump's voice in the background and, uh, and then you can see Buzz Aldrin who becomes a kind of like a... A rubber-faced alien or something. It's 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 rather uncomfortable to watch yeah. actually. But I, th I think it's it's probably not fair to draw too much into it because of his age. Yes, he might have a bit of Alzheimer's or something like something that. Like he, is, that. He, is a, he is a very old guy. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, I mean, yeah. not in not in 2004 when he was being interviewed by Bart Zabral. He, right. he was compass mentis then, but right. he's he is a very old guy now. Yeah. So we'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. Although it is very weird to watch. Um, now, is, you've got some more moon evidence you wanted to... Well, there's just a few things about. I think that are probably worth adding, which have, again, more recent ones that have come up. The first one is this clip of uh, Don Pettit, uh, who's this NASA astronaut who basically will play the clip. It's very, very short. And this was released in an IB Times video, which I think was a collation of um, little um, sound bites from people that work at ESA, the European Space Agency, and a few other people, uh, one of whom was this Don Pettit character who says that they destroyed the technology that took them to the moon. Well, let's have a look at that then. I can go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. Now, did you just hear that, friends? This crazy Don Pettit character is trying to tell us that NASA destroyed the tech again? <laughs> oh, my dear God. I just laugh every time I see that character because he belongs on Sesame Street or on the Children's Television Network, not with NASA or any other intelligent space agency. <laughs> Oh, my dear God. Well, if you think that's funny, let's just lighten the load a little bit here, and let's get the comic dude in here to see what he's got to say about this. So, take it away, comic dude! Yay! Yeah, so I get this email from a scientism website begging me for money. <laughs> yeah, it said, special offer until midnight to the ends of the earth and beyond. <laughs> yeah, now that sounds like real science, right? I'll support that. <laughs> We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon. The sky is uh, deep black uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. And we could not see stars. It's, it's not this a black cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the, there's all the stars there. And the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. And when you're, when you're in space and you're looking into deep space and you're on the sun side of the orbit, uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight so you can't see any stars just like here on Earth. 
Yeah, you can, and there's more than stars. You can see planets. You can right. see moons. You, you see the ga the gas uh, Magellan clouds of yeah, the Milky yeah, Way galaxy. Yeah, yeah, you see the And when you're in space and you're looking into deep space and you're on the sun side of the orbit, uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight, so you can't see any stars, just like here on Earth. Pretty much all the time, you can see yeah. the stars. Then when you look out into deep space away from the sun, it's the darkest black you can imagine. Just the inherent beauty of it, the velvet, bottomless bucket of the universe, in like just hanging there in a vast sea of darkness, and the most frightening darkness that you could ever imagine. And pretty much all the time, you can see yeah. the stars. So this is a unique shot. I want you to see this for several reasons. Number one, look at the star field. Look how the background is illuminated with countless stars. And then I want you to see this. Okay. Wouldn't you say that that's what you would expect to see if you were up in outer space? Uh, in this case, about 200 and, what is the uh, space station? About 220 miles above the Earth, something like that. So, there you go. But it gets interesting. Oh my goodness, looky here. Here's another shot from the International Space Station. We're going to say that that is the sun, but I really want you to pay attention, and I will expand this. Look at this, folks. Look at the density, again, of the whole background, the star fields. Now, I found this picture, I thought, interesting, um, because to me, it represents a what the real sun would look like. But here again, the mystery begins because we do not have any of the star field. Another interesting shot, this one is here, really see how you can really see the defined um, layers of the atmosphere. This is the sun. Now I found this picture interesting because you can actually see even in the midst of the glow, uh, of the brightness of the luminosity of the sun and all of its brilliance, you can still see stars back here. So now we got an, I don't know, interesting uh, question is sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But we continue. Man, I'll tell you what, I've seen the full moon uh, closer out of my back porch, but I'd say that that's pretty good representation. Why no stars? This is an Ultra HD 4K. Check that out, folks. So, again, check out the sun. See how it looks here. Um, we get a clear view of the stars there, right? So, these are the questions I've been asking myself. Another odd picture. Here's another great picture, you know, of the brightness of the luminosity of the sun and all of its brilliance. You can still see stars back here. You see, the vibration of my voice box makes the air vibrate between us. Then when the air vibrates your eardrum, you hear what I'm saying. But maybe you've seen a demonstration of a bell under a glass jar. With normal air inside the jar, you could hear the bell clearly. But when the vacuum pump drew the air out of the jar, there was nothing inside to carry the vibrations of the bell. Nothing until the air was let back into the jar. The camera to the photo number. And this is two number two. Sounds in space um, 
it's odd to have a hammer or a metal tool and bang it against something and hear absolutely nothing. You can, you know, sound went trapped in the vacuum, so there you are outside and you could be hitting something, no sound at all. In space, since there's no, uh, there's no atmosphere, there's no air, mm -hmm. if you bang on something when you're doing your spacewalk, you will not be able to hear that. And this leads us to the dilemma of our final segment. All modern astronauts, such as Piers Sellers and Mike Massimino, claim to hear absolutely nothing when they're out on the International Space Station in the vacuum, banging away with metal tools and objects. Whereas during the Apollo missions, all kinds of sounds have been recorded that should not be possible if they are on the moon in the vacuum of space. That does not sound like the spacesuit acting like a drum at all. It sounds like a metal hammer striking a metal object repeatedly with authority. Pictured is Alan Bean during Apollo 12 striking a metal core tube into the so-called lunar surface with a metal hammer. This is an interview with Apollo astronauts Alan Bean and Pete Conrad done by the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal. They are once again taking the position that the sound is coming through the hand and transmitting into the microphones in the helmet. Alan Bean says, I would have said it wasn't possible. And Pete Conrad responds, the other guy can't hear it. If the sound is coming through Alan Bean's microphone, then like his voice, it must be transmitted directly into the headset of Pete Conrad. So his statement makes no sense. Alan Bean's statement makes a lot of sense since it would not have been possible in a vacuum. When Bean says, I would have said it wasn't possible, he has science on his side. And he also has NASA on his side, at least up until August 19th, 2011. And this brings us to the most important graphic in the film. This is a web page that has been disappeared from the internet by NASA as of August 2011. It was at NASA.gov running concurrently with the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal between 2009 and September 2011. However, this page, which was created for children, you can see the banner at the top, Lunar Science for Kids. This page directly contradicts the assertions made in the Apollo Lunar Surface Journal concerning the hammering sounds in Apollo 12, 15, and 17. This page talks about the science involved with sound on the moon, and it does so correctly. And that is why NASA has disappeared it from the web. The contradiction between the journal and this page was brought up in the very popular Moon Zoo Forum. And that is where I first became aware of the situation. Reader Tom128 pointed out the contradiction between the site for children and the journal. And I went looking for the site for children and could not find it. I then went to my favorite research tool, the Wayback Machine at archive.org, and I was able to find an old version of the page that NASA did not clean up. And whenever I see information go missing from the web, it always starts me thinking, and this was the genesis of the film. At that moment, I became a NASA moon hoax researcher. You've seen the image on the right of the graphic before. That is Alan Bean hammering a core tube during Apollo 12. And this is the sound of such hammering. The graphic is problematic for NASA because of the contradiction to the journal and the graphic is correct science. And I quote, Sound needs something to travel through to get from one place to another. On the moon, since there is no air, sound cannot travel above the surface. So, there are no sounds on the surface of the moon. When the Apollo astronauts were out on the moon's surface, they could only talk to each other and to mission control by using the radios in their air-filled helmets. Even when the astronaut in the photo to the right hit a metal tube into the ground with a hammer, no sound was made. 
the Apollo 11 photographs have a ton of inconsistencies, not the least of which is this spotlight effect we can see here. If you play with the brightness a little bit, it accentuates the fact that the guy is standing in a circle of light. In more than one photograph. There are later Apollo mission photographs that do seem to show what looks to me like sunlit terrain. Unlike the Apollo 11 photos. The problem with the next photograph is that they took no other light source with them to the moon. The sun is the only thing that's lighting things up up there. He's in the shadow of the lunar module, so how do we see reflections off his boot heels? And how does one leg cast a shadow on the other leg? These types of things are all indicative of another light source. They're consistent with another light source to the right of the camera. The copper-colored piece of equipment in this next series has solar panels coming out the right and left sides. Now that right side isn't exactly what I would associate with 1960s solar technology, but what do I know? Maybe the cameraman will step to the left and give us a view of that left-hand solar panel. Okay, see, that is what I expect to see out of solar technology, sort of a glassy, mirrory, reflective finish there. Not this matte black kind of coloring. I don't understand why they're different. The next photo confirms that the left side is a mirrory kind of finish. Maybe if we get him to step to the left one more time, he'll get us a real good shot of that solar panel. Look, man, you cannot start with this, proceed to this, and end with this. It's just bad storytelling. You lose your audience. You make them disbelieve.